Hi, I thought I'd take a look at a forum question and hopefully uh, try and find an answer for this particular uh, forum contributor. And I get uh, emailed questions like this a lot of times. Somebody has a problem with their circuit, it doesn't work, they want to figure out why. And unfortunately, I often don't have time to uh, answer these questions directly just to, due to the volume of email I get and I've actually got a template form response um, that I don't like to send but ultimately sometimes I have to say and look I, I think it's better if you ask it on the forum you'll get a better wider response from people and the forum is the best place to answer these sort of things and occasionally I'll jump in and uh, look at a forum question like this and answer it I did actually uh, potentially answer it down the bottom I thought it'd make an interesting question so the forum contributor is Darkwing, uh, and Darkwing uh, so I've built this circuit up. Here's a, uh, it's a 74HC390 uh, ripple counter, and all they want to do is divide um, a pulse signal coming in. And there's the breadboard circuit, and the Rigol scope, and what it's supposed to look like. Of course, it's supposed to be just a simple 4-bit uh, binary counter. That's it. But it doesn't look like it's counting in binary. It looks there's, there's something <laughs> something going on here. So let's try and analyze this circuit and see what's going on because there's potentially a lot involved in here. We'll go into the data sheets and have a look at the circuit configuration and, and try and figure this out. Let's go. Now I've reverse engineered the breadboard and here's a Dave CAD drawing of that. You can see that we've got the uh, the two halves, so to speak, of the HC390 ripple counter. The ripple counter actually contains two sets of these. So there's a divide by two and a divide by five like this. And you can use them separately or you can do what Darkwing has done here and connect the Q output of the first divide by two into the divide by five. And of course that gives you a divide by uh, ten counter uh, sorry it's a decade counter i said it was a four bit uh binary it's actually a decade counter in this particular chip so and it's driven via an optocoupler over here and uh, we can see that sorry it's um uh, the <laughs> breadboard's upside down so all the electrons are going to fall out can't quite make out the resistor values but i think that there's a 270 ohm in series i could be wrong and i think it's a 2k7 pull up to VCC and there's a byte the first thing you might think aha it's the chips not bypassed properly for example but there's a bypass capacitor in there I think Darkwing says it's a hundred uh, here it is uh, does not divide by two uh, they do the second stage does not output a recognizable pattern. What could be wrong? Is somehow necessary to stabilize the IC? Darkwing found that if he put a 0.1 microfarad across the VCC and ground, it did a little bit to improve this, but probably not much. So, can somebody give me a hint? So let's look at the uh, circuit here, and you can see that, uh, sure enough, um, uh, let's just assume that the power supply is fine and hunky-dory, and there's a bypass uh, cap on there. You should actually put it directly to the pin over here, but it's reasonable. There's a little bit of extra inductance caused by that link there going over, but on a breadboard at the, for this particular type of chip at, the, at these sorts of speeds, like at edge rates, it doesn't matter, right? So uh, that's bypassed just fine. So we've got our ground and power going into our chip. I've done a video where you can potentially make a, a mistake and power your chip through your signal pins. And I'll have to link that one at the end because that is quite fascinating. And that's something where some people come a gutter where you think your circuit is working and it does seem to work in most cases. Then all of a sudden you get some input pattern to your chip and it fails. It's because you don't have the power pin connected and it's a reverse powering through the uh, protection diodes and stuff like that. But let's just assume that all the connections are okay. The first thing you want to suspect on a breadboard is a bad connection. For example, uh, these resistors, when you peel, if you get them on the bandolier thing, right on the reel, they'll have those bandoliers on them. And if you actually just pull them out of that bandolier and go stick them in your breadboard, that's a bad idea because there's actually a bit of adhesive or glue uh, inside on those tapes. Um, so the ends of the resistor, the ends that you're going to plug into your breadboard uh, might often contain, if you just pull them out, they will contain a little bit of glue and that can be um, <laughs> non-conductive. So you got to plug it plug it into your breadboard and often that glue is not really it's not all that visible so you might go to pull your resistor out of your bandolier plug it in and it might make bad contact because it's got the glue on there so make sure you either clean that or cut them off the bandolier if you're going to use them in your breadboards little trap for young players that one
come and guts up many times, trust me. Anyway, let's assume that all the connections in the breadboard are good and there's something wrong with the circuit, either the wiring of this or there's something wrong with the chips or there's something wrong somewhere else. Well, let's take a squiz. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is take a look at the data sheet for our uh, Texas Instruments uh, 74HC390. And it was a TI uh, part. You can see that down there. It's got the little TI logo that's upside down. But pretty much any HC series data chip is going to be uh, adequate here. So no problems whatsoever. So let's uh, go down and take a look. Here is our counter, the divide by two and the divide by five. And you'll notice that there's a little knot in there it's called a knot little circle that means that this clock is going to go down on the negative edge like that oh sorry i've got my laser pen on but it's going to be uh, clocked on the negative edge and you can actually see that down here in the uh truth table uh the negative when the clock goes negative like that it will actually do the count but if it goes positive then you get no change. So it counts on the negative edge. And that might actually matter for our circuit configuration as we'll take a look at. Now, uh, let's go down here. There's the internal circuit for those playing along at home if you wanna see. Anyway, uh, what we've got is the master reset and the reset pin of both of these is actually connected down to ground. I've checked that, so that's hunky-dory. So there's nothing wrong with the reset and that is an active high because there's no not in there like that so it's and you can look at the truth table and you can see that and darkwing has connected correctly connected the uh, q0 output through to the clock input of uh the divide by five counter so that gives our divide by 10 counter so that should be hunky dory right everything looks fine right so we know our chips bypass we know the uh reset is all okay and the other thing is is that the other pins aren't tie the other pins aren't the inputs on the other side of the chip here because i said it's got two of these uh divide by uh 10 counters in it they aren't connected and generally speaking you shouldn't leave the inputs floating on cmos devices like this so i'd tie pins one two and four down to ground like that just so that the inputs are tied off but in this particular case i greatly doubt that is the cause of our problems here, really, because we've got a should have a low impedance drive into the other inputs. Should one half of the uh, chip shouldn't affect the other half. It just might the inputs to these uh, pins here. If you leave them floating, they might uh, oscillate, which causes extra power dissipation inside the chip. But it shouldn't affect the other half of the chip. So that's not really a problem. Right, so if the circuit's correct, the power supply is correct, we've got adequate uh, chip bypassing, what's the problem? Well, literally the first response I said was that uh, 74HC, in fact, any uh, logic uh, device, has a maximum input slew rate. So make sure your inputs are nice and fast edges. And if we go and have a look at the circuit up here and see what it's driven from, well, the clock input here is this green wire, uh, pin 15 up here. It's going over to here. It's going through. I believe that's a 270 ohm resistor and that's jumping over to uh, What pin 6 of this uh, HP 3700 so let's go and have a look at the HP 3700 might have already guessed that this is a uh, AC to DC logic interface. It's an opto coupler and if we have a look at our internal circuit the output is coming from pin 6. This is buggering off to our circuit. That's the clock pulse. And you'll notice that that is an open collector transistor. There's nothing. It's not a totem pole output, which means so there's no active transistor in here that can actually drive this input very fast up to the positive rail. It's an open collector output. So you have to, of course, rely on a pull-up resistor to VCC here. In this case, it's I think it's 2K7 uh, pull-up. But even if it's like a very low value, like uh, 2.7 uh, 270 ohms or something like that, in this particular case, when you go positive, then it's not going to be a nice sharp edge like that. It's going to have a slew like that, and that could that slew there 
uh, could be in the order of microseconds. It depends on uh, the capacitance of the load that you're driving, i.e. the input of the chip that you're driving, capacitance of the breadboard, capacitance of the PCB circuit traces if you're using a PCB, any other components uh, that are connected onto that bus as well. Which is why not only 74HC but any form of logic will have a maximum fan out, uh, which is how many gates you can actually drive. It's due to uh, the capacitance mostly. This transistor here, it should in theory give you a nice fast negative going pulse like that. There won't be much slew, but we can actually go down. First thing we'll do is go down and have a look at the data sheet. Shall we? Let's go and have a look to see if we actually have a value for our slew rate. Shall we? Here it is. Output, which is the rise and fall time, is the output slew rate. So you'll see that the output fall time here, here we go, is... 0.5 microseconds, 500 nanoseconds. That's not particularly quick. And so keep that 500 microsecond figure in mind. And the output rise time is 45 microseconds. But as I said, that varies with the capacitance load and the pull-up resistor that you're actually using. In this case, they give you a for a nominal, that value is for a nominal uh, 4.7K and 30 puff or 30 uh, picofarads output, which might be typical uh, input capacitance of a gate or whatever. So there you go, at best, we're probably going to get 500 nanoseconds fall time, which as we said, due to this negative not input here, it's a negative going clock edge. So that's what we're concerned with. So let's go down into the 74 series data sheet and have a look at our maximum rise and fall time, shall we? Just what you do when you're looking at data sheets, just you know what units it's going to be. It's going to be seconds. So it's going to be microseconds, nanoseconds, you know, things like that. So you just want to scroll down. You like you don't even have to read any of this stuff on the left hand uh, column over here. Just scroll down, microseconds, microseconds. Is there any aha microseconds clock pulse width? Now this is the clock pulse width. This is not what we want. This is actually the minimum width of uh, the pulse before it'll uh, it gets ready to count the next one because it's got to propagate through the chip because this is a ripple uh, counter. So let's assume that the clock goes negative here. It takes a certain amount of propagation delay to get through the gates inside there before the Q output changes and before it can be clocked again. And this is a ripple counter, which means that this Q output, assuming you've tied it to... Whoop, Assuming you've tied up to here like this, then it'll ripple through here. It's got to go through like that. And then the output of this has to go into the clock of the next one. And then it takes propagation delay to get through to here. And then it takes propagation delay to get through to here and through there. So uh, that is why, uh, this is why it's called a ripple counter. The clock ripples through all the different gates as opposed to a synchronous counter. But that's not our issue uh, here. Right, so it's really got nothing to do with the clock pulse width. That's fine. I don't think we're, we've got an issue here. And you'll see that's only a minimum value because there is no maximum value for that. It can be one hertz. It can change. You can have one clock pulse every year if you want. And it makes no difference. It doesn't care. All the chip cares about is the edge rate. All it cares is how fast does it... Ah, stupid tool. All it cares is how fast does it transition down? How long does it take? So let's keep going to find some more nanoseconds-y. Aha, reset removal time. Won't worry about that. Reset because it's just tied to ground. We're not having, we don't have like a synchronous or asynchronous system reset or anything like that. Reset pulse width is going to have a minimum value. Uh, we don't care about that because it's just permanently tied to ground. But let's go down to here. Actually, before we get to that, Look, here's our input capacitance. You know how I said before that can change uh, your slew rate? Well, it's a maximum of 10 picofarads here, 10 puff, which isn't a huge amount. And that's maximum. It could be like half that as a typical value. They don't give you any uh, typical values in there. But, you know, there's a little bit, half a poofteenth of capacitance in there. So that could matter. But in this case, that's not really our problem. So this is interesting. All we've got down here is clock pulse widths we don't care about. Reset removal times, pulse width removal time we don't care about. Clock pulse width again, reset remover, those are, that's for the HCT types. And then we've got switching parameters down here, which are your propagation 
delays. We're not concerned with propagation delays. That's only a system implementation when you are implementing a ripple count or how long it takes to ripple through each segment, as I was uh, talking about before. But this isn't anything to do with our uh, maximum slew rate. So output transition time, this is how long it takes to transition the output. It transitions in typically 15 nanoseconds, for example, goes up with temperature and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, generally, but it's a reasonably fast output uh, edge on this thing. But all we care about is the input. So this is interesting. I, I did not read this data sheet before I jumped into this. I'm assu I assumed it was in here. There is no mention. We're, we're down to the package stuff. There is, as actually, we've come a gutsa. There is no mention of the maximum slew rate of the clock input. I must be blind. I should, like, prepare for this stuff before I press record. Now, it does tell you up here the switching specifications are for a uh, T-Rise, that's what the little R there stands for, it is the rise time, and the four times are six nanoseconds. So all this stuff is tested, and all these, all these specs apply for when you apply a six nanosecond rise and four pulse. That's very quick, actually. Um, so that's assuming that, but it doesn't actually tell you what the maximum transition is. And there's no, like, notes that are down here. So it's got to be in here somewhere. It's not in any of the footnotes down here. So let's go up all the way. Bingo. Input rise and fall time. Here it is here. They specify for the different uh, voltages. 500 nanoseconds maximum. So there you go. So it's actually going to be slightly under that for 5 volts. Somewhere between like 450, 470. Something like that. Absolute maximum values. So right there, if we go back and have a look at our optocoupler here, uh, we could come a gutsa. Like, there's, like we're already at 500 nanoseconds there, half a microsecond for the full time, and that's with the transistor pulling it down. That's not the f horrible 45 nanosecond uh, rise time with a nominal 4.7k resistor into that capacitance load. Uh, yeah, it might be faster than that, but it's like in the order of tens of microseconds with the resistor 2k7 we're talking about here. Uh, even the full time's no good. So right there, where we're incredibly marginal right there. I, like, I'd, I'd be concerned right at that, let alone for the rise. So that's a huge red flag. Not only are you op operating outside of uh, the... And these are just typical values too. They could change with temperature and, and uh, parameter spread across production units and stuff like that. Already, we're really concerned that that's not going to meet our specification for our rise and fall times. And of course, this is a known problem when you try and clock logic chips or even just transition the inputs and things like that. You can cause them to go metastable. So yeah, I, I think we got it. There's not really much practical difference between any of the uh, logic HC or HCT or F or anything else. Like there can be small differences. And if you're designing right on the edge of the spec, the brand of the chip might make a difference. There's a few cases where I've, I've personally had that, but um, generally speaking, when you're modestly designing, it shouldn't matter at all. But if you remember, as we saw on the data sheet, it was already typically 500 nanoseconds. So we're already borderline, even going negative with that uh, fast transition with the open collector output there, it's still borderline slow. And what happens is if your input is too slow, it can cause the chip to go into a metastable state. Metastability. Have I done a separate video on that? If I haven't, I've covered it in, in some video somewhere. Anyway, metastable state, which means you don't, don't know where, what it's doing. It could be getting multiple clock, uh, clock pulses. It could be getting none. It could be skipping pulses, getting multiple ones, which is why we could be seeing this weird effect, accounting effect, that we get in here because this could be a metastable input caused by slew rate. So I'm almost 100% certain 
that <laughs> the input slew rate caused by this uh, opto coupler here, this open collector opto coupler, and this pull up resistor here is what's causing the problem. The in this case, the negative going pulse is just is too slow for this thing, and it just it can't count properly, which is why it's giving you a weird counting configuration. So if Darkwing actually uh, bypasses that and feeds it from a nice clock source from your signal generator or some other TTL device, you'll fix it. Or if you really wanted to use uh, this, or if you had to use the optocoupler, obviously it's feeding in some sort of AC signal, wants to convert that to digital and then clock the thing, which is fine. But in this case, you want a Schmidt trigger input. And I'm sure I've done a video on Schmidt triggers. If I have, I'll link it in. A Schmidt trigger won't get into a metastable state. But most chips do not have Schmidt trigger inputs, Schmidt trigger clock or data inputs. So in this particular case, if you wanted to use your 74HC390 still, then you would put a, say, a 74HC14, which is a Schmidt trigger inverter, in front of that so that it would clean up that low signal. So if you've got your opto coupler like this here, okay, and you've got your pull-up resistor like this, instead of feeding that in your 74HC390, you feed it into a 74HC14, and I can draw my Schmidt in there like that. That's the symbol for a Schmidt inverter. And this input here can be as slow as a wet week. It can take a second to ramp up, and the Schmidt just goes meh. I'll convert that into a nice, beautiful, in this case, sorry, nice, beautiful, negative, because it's an inverter, nice, sharp, negative going output pulse, which then you can feed in to the clock input of your chip and Bob's your uncle. You won't get any more meta stability on your 390 over here and that will fix the problem. So yeah, these opto couplers notoriously bad for driving chips. Other things with open collector like an I squared C bus, for example, this is why the I squared C bus, which is an open collector bus, they the typical recommendation is uh, 2.2K uh, pull up resistors, but you might uh, lower that to 1K if you want the bus to operate faster. If you've got more things on the bus, which has more capacitance, which causes a greater uh, rise time in your signal when it transmits transitions from negative to positive, um, those open collector buses and other clocks like optocouplers are a real pain in the butt. So I reckon that is the problem. So I've actually been waffling on for like 20 minutes about the slew rate and how that's a problem, and it will be. Um, but that doesn't mean that's the only problem here. There could be multiple problems. And by the way, looking at this, uh, the issue is, is that this, uh, this is the input, this is the, is that the, yeah, no, that's the clock one, clock two, um, and it's like inverting that, so that could be caused by the metastability uh, problem of the first divide by two counter that we're looking at. But once you get the output of that chip, you don't, and you're feeding it into the second stage here, you don't have that meta stability, well, you, you still have a meta stability problem, but you don't actually have it, uh, this chip go meta stable because the input should be transitioning nice. But the problem with that is, is that the output of your divide by two counter, because it's being clocked by a, a slow slew input that could be going metastable. The output could be oscillating like buggery, doing all sorts of weird things, and then that might not have the setup and hold times or the clock pulse width requirements that we saw in the data sheet before to uh, then clock the divide by five. So once again, I would have expected to see a more normal count on this side here. So what I'd be doing if I was Darkwing, I'd also be zooming in on my Rigol scope on that yellow waveform there and checking out to see if there's any multiple clocks. In fact, can you get a hint of that in there? Maybe not, but yeah, zoom in on your time base, zoom in and see if you're getting multiple transitions on there. And if it's oscillating, then you know it's like it's going meta stable and going crazy like that. But yeah, why, why we're not getting a more normal countdown here? I don't know, um, the reset, uh, pin. No, that's uh, tied to ground, so that's all right. So really, it can only be the inputs uh, really causing that. So there might be some goofy setup and hold uh, output of your first divide by two stage, maybe 
oscillating and all that, doing all sorts of weird stuff, doesn't meet the requirements for the clock pulse of the second stage, and that's goofing up the uh, clocking of the second stage and stuff like that. Because if you go back here and have a look at the internal diagram for this thing it's you know it, it it's relatively complicated right i mean if, if your inputs if it's like you've got your clock pulse here okay pin 12 then it's got to drive all these gates here and if it's doing all sorts of oscillations there's going to be like set up and uh, like set up times and and stuff like that minimum clock, clock pulses as i said that we saw in there and if you're not meeting any of those then this can really screw up this configuration in here. And that's probably why we're seeing the weird count there. Uh, rather than, of course, because the pin 12 that we're driving, there's no, there shouldn't be a slew rate problem there because it's being driven from the output of the divide by two counter, which should be a nice, uh, sharp uh, TTL, uh, HC, you know, CMOS slew rate. So yeah, that shouldn't be a problem, but yeah, it, there's some funny business going on there, which is screwing everything up. But I think ultimately the problem is the input slew rate. If you fix that, everything else should fall into line. That's the plan anyway. So there you go. I hope I've uh, answered Darkwing's question. I hope he follows up uh, with this and um, lets us know what the problem is. Anyway, so that's what I said down here. It has maximum input slew rate. Yep, your clock pulse is coming from an optocoupler. That will be creating a slow positive, ne it's actually a negative edge. Uh, uh, sorry, positive edge, yes. Um, and potentially a slow negative edge as well. That optocoupler is not that quick. Um, and try reducing your pull-up resistor for starters, etc. So there you go. Um, and say a flubby dust down here mentioned, yeah, the floating inputs. But in this particular case, uh, that's, I, <laughs> that's, I'm pretty sure that's not the problem here. It's not going to interfere with the other half of the chip. Just might be oscillating and drawing more power consumption would be the only thing if that. So there you go. I hope you found that uh, interesting. I could go into details about logic threshold levels and meta stability and all sorts of stuff, but all this sort of stuff requires its own video, a video in its own right, really. So anyway, if you, uh, I hope that's the answer. Otherwise, I'm going to be really embarrassed if I miss something and it's just this breadboard wiring error or it's a, as I said, a contact problem or or something like that. But yeah, um, notorious, these optocouplers, when you're driving, you don't want to drive signals directly from open collector like that. Um, so in this particular case, the first step would be to simply reduce the value of the resistor, go really low, go a couple hundred ohms and see if that <laughs> fixes a problem or look at that edge with your scope. It's got a Rigol scope there, more than good enough to look at the uh, the slew rate, either the positive and negative in this. The positive one's going to be the worst because it's got the pull-up resistor, but also the negative, just to see how uh, fast and sharp that pulse is. That uh, Rigol should be more than good enough of... Uh, more than good enough to uh, measure, you know, the tens of nanoseconds, um, or hey, in this case, hundreds of nanoseconds, uh, possibly, that we're going to get there. Any slow, uh, any low bandwidth uh, scope will be able to do that. So there you go. Hope you found that interesting. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. And as always, discuss down below. Catch you next time.